Good morning. You're listening to Central Wisconsin's 24-hour information station, AM 1320 WFHR. It's time now for the Morning Magazine, brought to you by Comfort Air Heating, Cooling, Plumbing. Now, with the Morning Magazine, here's Carl Hilke. Thank you, Jerry, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's show on AM 1320 and streaming live at WFHR.com. We also welcome our friends from Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. Jesse's here, and the reason why he's here for the first half hour, it's time for our Wood County update with County Board Chairman Lance Plimo. Good morning, Lance. Good morning, Carl. Thanks for having me in today. Um, just had a little bit of Jeff Ziegler's famous salsa. It's good. <laughs> it warms you up. Let's put it this way. I talked to him in the parking lot for a minute, but he didn't offer me any salsa. Well, we got some in the okay. break room. When you leave here, go help yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, this has been a weird winter in many ways, so I wanted to talk, uh, touch bases with you because well, winter tourism plays an important role in, in Wood County, and this, been, this has not been a good winter when it comes to winter tourism or winter sports. So um, I believe the only snowmobile trails that were ever opened were up in far northern Wood County. Everything down here in southern Wood County never opened. So uh, what, what has it been like? And what's the uh, the economic impact to Wood County? Well, the winter sports season has been terrible uh, in Wood County. We did get the trails opened up in, you know, the Marshfield end of the county for a couple of days here or there. But generally speaking, you know, the combination of, you know, ice, warm weather, then we'd get probably adequate snow followed by 40 degree temperatures again and more rain uh, just lent to no snowmobile trails being open. Uh, devastates the usage at Powers Bluff and it, it has a tremendous impact uh, on the tourism economy in Wood County and uh, you hope these winters don't come along very often or else that uh, you know it's 60 degrees every day uh, and some of the <laughs> other uh, avenues for recreation open up but it, it's been a tough one in that respect uh, so the businesses suffer obviously uh, those that cater to those activities you know on the plus side uh, you know it cuts down from a county perspective some of the dollars that we might expend on you know, snow clearing, road maintenance, although ice storms are worse than snow. Uh, those are, you know, each one of those events is a huge impact to the budget. Those are not easy, but generally speaking, fairly unscathed this winter in that respect. And, uh, but on the positive side, uh, today, uh, this weekend is going to be a huge weekend in Wisconsin Rapids. you got the state gymnastics tournament and the state bantam hockey tournament in town. Yeah, we, we do a remarkable job in that respect. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, youth baseball, you know, hockey, soccer. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to even leave any of them out, you know basketball but you you name it uh we have a lot of great facilities here uh we have people in this community that are willing to step forward and help run those events and for those of you who have not attended for instance the state gymnastics tournament for a great event uh and and we're getting even better facilities at lincoln high school uh as we move forward uh all of those a little bit different part of that tourism industry but something that we've worked very hard to foster in our area and it certainly benefits the community you know much as the rafters do in the summer the river kings do uh in the winter and they're having another great season yeah they got the uh, playoff they, in round two of the playoffs uh, they dropped the puck on thursday because of the bantam tournament they got to play on thursday uh, uh to start off their next round of playoffs and minnesota's in town for that so yeah i mean uh, so in that respect and that's also a good exposure for this area because people see Wisconsin Rapids or in Wood County on the news stories. Yeah, you know, any, any, you know, any publicity is pretty much good publicity, and, and that is the good kind of right. publicity. And, and we certainly, uh, you know, want to assist in any way we can for that. And that's where, you know, it's important when we provide infrastructure uh, from a government perspective, you know, make sure those roads are good and, and communication is adequate. You know, when people can come up and spend that extra day because uh, they have access to broadband, uh, because the roads are good, because we have adequate facilities uh, in our hotels and motels, lends well to the entire economy. Um, what about the roads and with this winter with the free? Freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing. Are you concerned about that as we get into the spring maintenance season? Absolutely. Uh, it wreaks havoc on, okay. on roads. That's what you I know, thought. You drive over them and, you, you know, you're bouncing along and you're kind of, you know, bu -bu 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 -bu. <laughs> like you, you know, you can feel it. And, and if you look at the, the potholes, uh, as a result of those are everywhere. There's places that you can literally lose a car. Uh, less so in Wood County uh, than in my recent trip uh, to Milwaukee. When I say my recent trip, it seems like I'm down there every week. Uh, <laughs> 
But, you know, we're in pretty good shape. And part of that is the dollars that, you know, we've allocated to improve our county highway system over the years. And, and some of the municipalities have done the same thing. Uh, you know, the small increase to your property tax bill uh, is far less than a single alignment uh, of your car when you hit one of those holes. So, you know, we look at all of those when we move forward. And uh, But th this is going to be a tough spring. Those guys are going to be out fill in potholes, reconstructing roads for quite some time into the future. I guess we all might as well just get ready for it. Yeah, if, it isn't, if it isn't one thing, it's another. And, you know, every, <laughs> every day we face uh, a lot of challenges. You know, I hate to call them problems. They're all challenges. And, you know, all units of government, you know, whether it's government, whether it's the school systems, districts, uh, you know, you all step up every day uh, and try to do the best you can for your community. As the state legislature is in the process of quickly trying to wrap up its... Uh its agenda. Your thoughts from a county perspective on what they've done and what they've yet uh, to do, and do you have some issues that you are watching closely or are concerned about? You know, there's always issues that uh, concern us because we are, you know, an administrative arm of state government, and, and all of those mandates that come down, if unfunded, create problems. Uh, you know, there are some some pretty big initiatives out there. The, the regionalization uh, of the youth uh, prison mm -hmm. or youth detention center uh it looks like now that the state's willing to fund most of that responsibility that will come down to those regional centers and and counties uh, but you always wonder what the future will bring uh you know i guess it's kind of amazing i actually asked a question the other day when i was in madison we were briefed by the legislature saying they're in session i i think they said you know one of them was one or two more days the other might have been 11 days uh and it amazes me that you're going to be out of session from pick your day you know march 15th until next year uh you know we, we have a full-time legislature uh you know and i understand they need to get back in their districts I, I fully understand that but when there's pressing issues i don't know you know the i always hear that there's a date we have to be gone and that's an arbitrary date set by them uh that would be like myself or a mayor saying no more meetings till next year. Uh, good luck. Now, I know they deal with issues, uh, and I know they're down there and, 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 and things happen. But at the same time, if there's a pressing issue, you know, I just hate to put a timeline on it and say we have to pass it by Tuesday or we're done until next year. That, to me, that does not make a lot of sense. I and mean, it doesn't lead to good legislation because lawmakers don't have the time to really study the issue or the bill that they are voting on. And sometimes there's mistakes in drafts and stuff. And then you come back the next session and you're going, uh oh, we made a mistake in line four, paragraph two, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you'd like you'd like to see every governmental body be deliberative, you know, in that decision making process. And you'd like to see them continue to work on that. And that does not mean in any way that government stops in Madison. I mean, every day policy is being created. Uh, the work continues to go on. Uh, but I hate when we're trying to cram something into a week or two weeks or three weeks, uh, when realistically, those are self-imposed deadlines. Nobody's saying it has to be done by that date. How is Wood County going to deal with that juvenile issue? Not sure yet. Um, not all, I was on a couple of conference calls last week uh, at the state level. Uh, they've, they've rolled out the generalities of what will happen, and that'll be you know, regional de detention centers, a couple of those in the Milwaukee area for sure. Uh, Lincoln Hills uh, going to close at some point, or, or at least there will be a different iteration of that facility, uh, whether it's an adult prison or a, uh, a detention center that might involve people who would otherwise uh, maybe be in a drug court mm -hmm. or, or something to that effect, you know, a halfway kind of center. But, you know, we don't know. Uh, the state has offered a fair amount of dollars to counties to step up and create those regional facilities, but there will only be let's say five, six, seven, I don't know, they've actually nailed it down exactly across the state, and then it will be up to the other counties to contract with those who have those facilities to provide those services. All I can tell you is that at a current cost of about $400 a day to house those particular juveniles, I'm hoping that when the counties take over, it can be at a reduced cost to the taxpayer. Well, I mean, I'm looking at the fact that you're in the Wood County Jail, you know, the, the sheriff record it says now is the time that we should be studying what we're going to be doing about the jail and now we got this <laughs> on top of yeah and we don't you know we don't house juveniles no. <laughs> you know so it's um it, you know it's a little different mix uh it's how are you going to handle that and then you know somebody 
it, you know, wasn't unique, but somebody said, well, what about the female prisoners? You know, and, and you can't have those mixed populations and much smaller group in juvenile detention uh, of that gender, but nonetheless uh, need to make arrangements and be able to house uh, you know those people and so i'm not exactly sure how it'll roll out the, the guarantees we've basically had from the state at this point though is uh there'll not be a lot of cost to the county it should be more efficient effective and a better way of doing business as we go forward uh the details will roll out i'm sure pretty shortly what about the um provision uh, expanding prosecutions prosecutors in the various counties to help with the backlog uh, additional uh, district attorney positions, yeah. Carol. uh can't hurt. You know, we have a, a, a burgeoning drug problem. Uh, we have a, a jail population that's been increasing. Uh, before you get to those places, you need to be adjudicated and go through that criminal justice system. And the caseload has increased tremendously over the last 15, 20 years, and yet we've done so with, you know, no additional staff. So at some point, they're going to need additional DAs. If you need additional DAs and you have more cases going through, you probably need additional judges. If you have additional judges, you need additional courtrooms and court reporters and, and judicial assistants. And um, although the state pays for, in effect, those positions, they don't pay for, you know, the space and the chairs and, and the additional staff and, and those types of uh, you know, the personal property needed to provide those services. And that typically comes down to the counties. And, and again, a lot of what we do is reactionary. It's what will be the big issue tomorrow? Uh, how do we deal with it and how do we handle it? Uh, you know, I, I think our judicial system in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin Rapids, in Wood County, although housed here at the courthouse, has done a tremendous job. Uh, you know, same number of judges, same number of DAs, huge increase in the number of cases. Uh, huge increases in the number of incarcerations, and yet uh, we've handled that through electronic monitoring, uh, through uh, working in agreement with Wapaka County to house uh, prisoners. Uh, we've been pretty effective to this point, but if it continues to grow at the same rate, there's going to be a problem somewhere. Uh, can um, are you? Do you have the infrastructure in place at the courthouse to uh, house a to handle a, an additional prosecutor or a DA or? or? It's like we worked on this ahead of time. Great segue. Uh, you know, part of the state, uh, the space needs study that we did a couple of years ago identified the additional space that we were going to need. And from a taxpayer perspective, we looked at putting up a building somewhere in that 30, 40, 50 million dollar range to accommodate that. And luckily, the River Block building became available. We were able to move all of our human services, health departments, land conservation, parks, and, and some of those services over to that building, which freed up. Uh, a large amount of space on the third floor of the courthouse, which at some point will probably be dedicated to just the judicial system. Uh, it, it allows us to have greater security. Uh, we, we do have the space up there to do that, and that was part of that anticipated need. We saw that coming. We had the opportunity to address it at a fraction of the cost of what it would have been had we gone a different direction. So, uh, yeah, I think we're, from a space standpoint, we're poised to handle the next you know, the foreseeable future, the next 20 to 30 years. Okay. Well, uh, so you, you, it worked out. <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah, and it, putting all those puzzle pieces together aren't easy. You know, there are some symbiotic relationships between departments uh, that lend to them being physically located next to each other. You know, for instance, it might be finance and HR uh, or dispatch and emergency government. And, you know, as we put those puzzle pieces together in the courthouse and exactly where we're going to move those departments, uh, you know, it takes planning, takes time, but I think we're prepared to do that. Uh, talk of transportation has changed a bit since uh, uh, the president talked about his infrastructure plan, which is based on public-private partnerships and, and, a, and a role for the states. And the governor basically came out and said, well, uh, if, if, if if I have to if we have to do this in order to get the federal funding, we might be willing to do so such as toll roads and, yeah. and the like. Your thoughts about this, uh, this evolving uh, discussion? All right, let's go. This, this is a Lance opinion, not a county board one necessarily. Okay. And I try to separate those. Uh, open road tolling, I think, is one of uh, the facets that are going to be needed to, to handle the uh, structural deficit that we have in highway funding in those budgets. Uh, there's a 
a number of proposals put forth by the local government institute in a report called filling potholes so if you went to the local government institute website and read that report it's pretty short uh and in fact it's pretty entertaining there's a number of pictures in there uh <laughs> you'd see what those uh, recommendations were. And, and I'm glad to see that that the governor and the state legislature are really taking a look at this because long-term it needs to be done. And, you know, I had somebody the other day, I was I happened to be listening to the radio, I was driving, they said, you know, these tow roads slow everybody down in their bottlenecks. I'm saying, this person must not have left Wisconsin recently and, and gone through Illinois or the other states that have open road tolling because you don't even slow down. I mean, you drive through at 70 miles an hour you got a uh, chip with your little your transponder right. and it picks it up. Uh, it automatically fills those, uh, you know, that piggy bank, so to speak, uh, electronically, you know, based on, you know, building your credit card. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a pretty amazing system. And if we need to do that and if we need to uh, engage in those public private partnerships or, um, there's a lot of solutions that were out there from, you know, vehicle miles traveled uh, with the, with exemptions for those who live in rural areas on the first X number of miles uh, to make it fair. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to fill that gap. And uh, the poll of uh, the tolling, um, it wouldn't be necessarily in like the rural areas. You're looking at the uh, border areas when people come into the state. Yes, the highly traveled corridors that, you know, the, the interstate system, you know, especially that you could almost call it a. a a square, you know, coming out of the Illinois up to Milwaukee, across to Madison, uh, you know, and back down to the Illinois border. It, the vast majority of highway funds that get expended get expended in that particular area because of the traffic. You know, you look at the cost of the Marquette interchange, the zoo interchange, yeah. uh, you know, what happens on 90, 94, uh, whether it be Chicago, Milwaukee, or the bypasses there. Uh, yeah, you're going to go into those high traffic areas just like you would anywhere else. So, um, um how would so you you would like to see a combination of all of these different things to what about bringing back indexing of the gas tax I, that's one of those um you know items that's on the table uh so is you know mechanisms to uh garner some dollars for those vehicles you know we have better get you know the gas Gas tax is interesting. You know, it used to be indexed, but then we have better mileage than we used to have. So we use less gas. Right. Uh, we have a lot of electric and or hybrid vehicles out there that, in effect, pay no tax. And so yet how they, are you going to work those into the equation? You know, yet they wreak the same havoc, you know, on the roads as the other vehicles. Uh, so there, there needs to be a mechanism to, to fairly share that burden uh, and to make our, you know, our highways better. Because if any of you have driven into... Uh, the Milwaukee area recently, like I said, you could lose a car in some of those holes going down, you know, 41 that way. 90, 94 quarters been worked on fairly significantly in the last couple of years. And, and they really need, they really do need to finish that, that whole interchange, you know, in Milwaukee because it's a mess right now. Okay. Um, and you, since you mentioned it, the, 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 the building you moved into in downtown Wisconsin Rapids, the old, uh, consolidated Papers Office Building, as it were, but it's the new home for Wood, for Wood County. Uh, how is that working now? Is you've been there for how many months now? As a, as a I think we're in pretty much in April. Um, okay. it, it's the River Block Building. Yeah, it's yeah. it's been a great addition for us. Um, the people who work there have generally adapted and like it. I know the clients who go in like it because all those services are housed in one place, and most people receiving services receive more than one government service and and now they're housed in a single building uh we have adequate space we have the privacy we need to talk to those people uh as, as, you know private matters or hipaa protected matters uh, it's been a really good fit uh, it just happened to become available at a time when we <laughs> needed it uh, you know i guess a little bit of luck both ways i think it helped solidify uh the downtown economically uh as our employees and those people who uh frequent those buildings are down there visiting those businesses and i i think you'll see continue to see development down there and I, and I you know I know the mayor talked about it as we spoke earlier yeah. uh, I think it lends to the further development of you know what's been referred to as the triangle project right yeah, that's good the reveal on that is coming up in a month or two with the developer they're going to have a special community meeting about that and then you got the YMCA Boys and Girls Club uh, downtown with the reconstruction of the mall uh, you know. Yeah, it, you know, it can't hurt at all. You know, there's, there's some people who are very concerned about, you know, the demise of the mall. But, you know, as I have the opportunity to travel the state and, and even to some extent the nation, um, malls, to a great extent, are a thing of the past. Yeah. Uh, you know, people are not frequenting those 
you know, those types of facilities anymore. So um, it, it was great when it was built. It served a purpose, and I, and I think we have a, the ability to repurpose that and lend, again, a, a tremendous economic boost to that part of the city. Now, was I sad to see some of the businesses leave uh, that were currently there and, and are not viable in other local? Absolutely. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is impact private industry. Uh, and that has happened to a little bit of an extent, but I, I think because of that development, you will see, uh, especially that area of town, begin to really flourish. And uh, you, you mentioned malls. My, uh, my brother lives in Palatine. I have a brother who lives in Palatine. You know Palatine, Illinois. Yep. And there's been a number of major malls in that area that have been repurposed into smaller shopping areas where people can drive up, get in, and get out because people got tired of walking Long malls just to miles get one. Miles. Yeah. So, I mean, and then Stevens Point, same thing happened. It, it changes everywhere. You know, ch change is inevitable. Embracing mm -hmm. it is difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's those, you know, I'll regress for a second. You know, sure. we're, we're, in the, we're in the process right now. Uh, again, you know, all of these local um, officials, there's an election coming up. And some right. of you just went through a primary. And, and I think I can speak on the on behalf of our entire board and probably all the local officials out there, you know, it really is a privilege to serve. Uh, and do we get uh, complained to and yelled at occasionally? Yes, that, that happens. But the challenges that face a community, uh, in, in our case, a county, uh, are not insurmountable. And they're challenges. You know, I try not to look at them as, as problems, but challenges. And every generation has faced those challenges. Uh, and it's a privilege to serve in those. And our current board, you know, the entire board, uh, will turn over. Uh, this will be the last board meeting that they sit, you know, in their current configuration. Uh, and then we have a new board that will sit there. And, and so do school districts and, and, and other City local councils, and governments. Yeah. And, you know, I think I can say with certainty that all those people have considered it a privilege to serve. Uh, going forward, new boards, uh, new people will face considerable challenges. Uh, there's going to be needs out there. You, you like to have long-term planning. It's what we look at. It's what we did when we did the Space Needs Committee uh, and the work that they did in the county. But, uh, I, you know, we've had this conversation. I Sometimes I just shake my head when people hear people say, we face, you know, insurmountable challenges. I'm thinking, I wonder what those people thought about in the 1940s, you know, World <laughs> War II or World War I or, or those people who faced the issues during the Vietnam crisis or or, or really some of the, the really violent race riots of, of the mid and late 60s. I mean, it, it was amazing w where we have evolved to, how we have evolved. Our problems aren't greater. They're just different. Uh, and, and we need to have that, you know, 360-degree thinking, that ability to look at problems from, from every angle, to say to yourself, what would I never do? Because sometimes it is exactly what I do. And so when we go forward, when we're looking at, you know, the downtown developments in Wisconsin Rapids, the roads, the highways, the school system, school safety, you know, mm -hmm. which which is at the heart of the news lately. And, you know, how do we harden targets? How do we look past that and see, you know, what caused that problem? You know, I look at, you know, right now, uh, firearms get blamed. We had firearms in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. That hasn't changed. But what has changed uh, that makes these somewhat regular everyday occurrences? Yeah. What role does the media what role does the media play? What role does government play? You know, how do we make things as safe as we can? But how do we address the real problems? And you've heard me say it, and I, and I make points. Sometimes I will say the ridiculous as part of a comment, and I don't want anybody to take that as as a single statement. But you know, why do we have those problems today? What's causing it? And and not. I realize it happens, and I realize we can be reactionary and and harden targets and do like that. But what's caused that problem to begin with? And, and we need to really take hard looks at that. And that's what these people that sit in these chairs every day, besides dealing with the crisis that occurs today, at all levels of government, we look at how do we try to solve those problems so those issues don't continue in the future. Well, as always, I appreciate the time. And unfortunately, we're out of it. <laughs> Already? I was just warming up. I know you were. <laughs> that's why I let you go. But I appreciate the uh, um, I guess we'll, we'll still have a, a, sh a show after the... Uh, uh. You'll, yeah, you'll still have a show after the April meeting. You'll be... Um well, It'll be yet to be seen if I'll still be here. Okay. Uh, like I said, there's an election okay. process that goes forward for yeah. every single county board member. I know. Well, thank you for what you've done for your service to Wood County, and thank you for being part of the Morning Magazine during that time. Thanks, and we Tom. wish you all Appreciate wish it. you the best. And that's Wood County Board Chairman Lance Plimmel. And that's going to wrap up part one of the Morning Magazine. The